closest to furthest away. Uh, so next to me is Zach Pong. Uh, Zach Pong uh, is uh, one of the folks who uh, put bull market together. Uh, he received an MS in political theory from the London School of Economics and a B in political science from Tufts University. He's one of the owners and managers of Bowen Market and sits on the board of directors for Union Square Main Street. Uh, his focus is on increasing vibrancy in Union Square uh, by supporting the amazing brick and mortar businesses that dot our streets uh, with creative promotion and collaboration. So thanks for being here with us tonight, Zach. Uh, next to him is Nadia Chang. Uh, Nadia's head of operations at Right Hand Robotics, uh, which is a proud Green Town Labs alum, and currently located on the street here in Union Square. He uh, ran R&D at Empire Robotics, uh, another Boston area startup. Uh, and uh, she received her PhD and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from MIT, uh, where her research focused on developing squishy robots. I'm going to remain here, Nadia. Uh, next to her is uh, Julia Trevelin. Uh, as Green Town Lab's Senior Director of Marketing and Chief of Staff, Julia drives the development and execution of the incubator's overall marketing, uh, communications, and public relations strategy. She leads and oversees the incubator's event strategy, content creation, social media, and liaising between Green Town Labs and its network of strategic partners uh, for all marketing related activities. Uh, in her role, she has a unique opportunity to serve as the in house marketing consultant. 90 plus companies here at Newtown Labs works to amplify their visibility. Uh, prior to this, we worked at a uh, B2B marketing firm focused on energy and technology at Newtown. Uh, and Greentown was one of those clients, in fact, uh, for a few years before she actually joined the team here. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Blogger. is Dan Martin, joining us here from the city of Somerville. Uh, so Dan is an urban planner with experience in zoning and policy development, form-based codes, station area and neighborhood planning, transit-oriented development, transportation demand management, uh, missing middle building types, and an understanding of women's scale and people-focused research. That's serious. Talent for simple yet defensible legal writing, and expertise in code drafting, regulatory analysis, and policy development. He is definitely one of the biggest people responsible for the zoning overhaul that's in progress here in Summer Road. So, we're going to that. Right on the right hand, we have uh, Callum Borchers, who is uh, moderating our panel this evening. He joined us from WBUR, where he's a senior innovation reporter covering the greater Boston business uh, community using uh, Boston Comics. Uh, he joined WBR uh, just this past year for the Washington Post, where he reported on the intersection of politics and media. Uh, he previously covered politics, business, and sports at the Globe here in town, and was editor of Citizens News in Naugatuck, Connecticut. Uh, so he holds a master's degree in journalism from Northeastern, and is a member of the Park Scholar Alumni Advisory Board at Ithaca College, where he his undergraduate. Um, thank you for uh, joining us to live this panel. That is 90.9 WBUR. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, panelists. Um, I assume it's very civically engaged audience, so you surely all recall that Union Square was part of Somerville's bid for Amazon's second headquarters. And if you have been paying attention to reporting from my alma mater, the Washington Post, you saw last week's report that Amazon is having second thoughts about its decision to put at least half of those workers in New York, in Long Island City. And in response, just last week, our governor, Charlie Baker, told the Boston Business Journal, quote, if they were to choose to decide they wanted to expand their footprint here, obviously we would be open to having those conversations. So, now uh, yeah, I'll start with you, since you are a local business owner. Do you want Amazon as a neighbor? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I have uh, uh, different perspectives. So our company, Right Hand Robotics, we build robots for fulfilling e-commerce orders. So there's um, maybe some particular interest there, but um, I mean, I think it's an um, interesting, bittersweet kind of thing. I mean, um, I grew up in the Bay Area, my family lives there, and you know, have all the tools, Facebook, so, and um, as uh, I've been in Cambridge for um, almost 12 years, and kind of biased towards the kind of, you know, from kind of a small um, startup world. Um, I think culturally it's very different um, than out in the area. And, um, in any case, I mean, I think there's good and bad in that, you know. For us, um, 
competing with Bay Area talent is always a challenge. So with companies like Amazon are here that make make it easier for us um, in certain ways. But um, yeah, it's it's hard to say what that might look like. But. And then how about for you, a little bit of the city's perspective here, because you know, when you think about a company like that, it's, it's a massive impact on, on transit, on traffic, on housing prices. There's also a lot of potential for economic drive in there, and there's also the spin-off companies, right? So that invariably go on to start smaller companies as well. So how does the city look at something like that? I don't know if I can speak for the entire administration, but yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that we always focus on is trying to attract, attract jobs to Somerville. There was uh, part of some provision identified the, the uh, jobs imbalance that exists compared to the workforce, and uh, the more we add more housing, bring more workers in, and we need to we need to bring in those those jobs to try to even achieve a lot of our transportation goals. A lot of a lot of the employees that are residents that live here travel outside the city to get, get to work, and we'd love for them to just travel within Somerville to get to work. Um, but, but something as big as Amazon needs to be mitigated related to the impacts to how housing prices and transportation impact. I, I think um, from a regional perspective that we, we need a lot more investment in the MBTA if we're going to bring along with somebody like Amazon and bring all the, all the housing jobs that come with it. And let's be clear, the second shot at HQ2 is a long shot, so but I, think it, I think it starts a worthwhile conversation and, and, uh, and maybe Zach will go to you next because I think the, the underlying question there is what kind of growth do we want in Union Square specifically and in Somerville or what? I mean, do you want a, a big company sort of parachuting in and sort of instant jobs like that? Or is it better to have the organic smaller job growth and smaller companies than we see in a place like Beaumont? Um, I'm very comfortable, uh, excuse me, I'm very uh, biased toward uh, small business growth and, and businesses that have uh, a history here that sort of understand what makes Union Square really great. Um, that's not to say that a business that comes from somewhere else can't be a really good fit here. Um, one of the things that would excite me about a, a large company like Amazon or any other landing in Union Square is sort of the immediate hit on daytime traffic. So, uh, you know, even Green Town Labs making this building a reality and bringing all the uh, additional businesses they have has had a really big impact on the small businesses that are trying to exist throughout the week here as opposed to just during the weekends uh, and evenings. Um, uh, so I think it, it may come down to the particulars of um, you know even where that building is or where that company is, what building they're in, uh, how they're able to connect, and if they're interested in connecting to the, the community of businesses and, and residents that are already here. Um, I don't know that you know one company would be or all companies are created equal or all companies are, are willing to make the effort to uh, engage um, as others would. So I think it, it may come down to you know, who their company is and, and how much they're willing to spend the time to, to integrate well with the community we already have in Union Square. And Julia, how do you think about this issue? Because some of my reporting that I've done recently, I've heard over and over mostly from venture capitalists that they would love to see more big players in the greater Boston scene. I'm not sure that all the entrepreneurs feel that way, but the VCs seem to be frustrated, at least in the tech space, that we tend not to grow the really big, you know, 10 plus billion dollar revenue type of companies. Um, and we have had a few exceptions to that rule, but, but really limited, more on the healthcare side, obviously, we see more in the private tech. So, at a place like Greentown Labs, I mean, how do you think about that? I mean, in other words, you're, you're growing companies that could someday become those unicorns. Um, is that preferable to sort of importing a company like Amazon or somebody else? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> for, yeah, um, we're looking at right hand to make that next company. So we're all about great time. Raise your hand if you've been to Great Town before. Hey, welcome back. Awesome. And welcome to new friends who haven't been here before. So we're all about growing uh, early stage companies that are early, kind of pre seed round of funding, very small teams, maybe two to five people when they first start. And then they grow while they're here, and they grow to 20, 25 company, people per company, they raise some funding, and then they graduate and they find their own facility, ideally right here in Somerville, like right hand robotics. So we're all about building the next, and maybe not next size Amazon, maybe someday. But um, I think we prefer to be focusing on our own talent here and growing them here so they can you know, flourish and prosper in our own region. Let me just back up a minute because you did a nice job of summarizing your work here at Greentown, and it's possible that uh, folks aren't always familiar with the other companies that we have up here. So let me just cross over to Nadia, and then I'll come over to you, Zach, as well. Give us a sort of a, a quick elevator, which you're probably well practiced in this by now. 
quick summaries of, of what your companies are up to right now, in case folks don't know. So at Right Hand Robotics, we build robots for basically fulfilling e-commerce orders. Um, e-commerce is growing like crazy today, as most of you probably know and are aware of, um, and it's only going to get crazier in the next two years. And the reality is there's already labor shortage in the warehouses today, and that problem is only going to be greater. And so how do we get people like all of us what we want and need faster? And, you know, of course, people are building businesses based on the fact that they can get stuff quickly. And um, so so that's that's... In a nutshell, what we do. Uh, and Walmart, which is right down the road, uh, is a collection of 30 small businesses uh, around the central public corridor. So we have um, restaurants, retailers, art spaces, um, as well as a comedy club, a uh, microbrewery, um, and we're looking to host um, looking to host a number of events throughout the year. And the real two focuses of Home Market are to lower the barriers of entry for uh, anyone to start up a brick and mortar business, um, to create a space for uh, the neighborhood and the community to uh, enjoy throughout the year. Thanks for those summaries, guys. Uh, Dan, I want to come to you with a slightly different topic that was in the news again this week. This will be breaking news, we basically know it, but the uh, traffic data firm Interix reported this week that we in Greater Boston you know, we're a leader in so many categories. As it turns out, we're also number one in the nation for labs, for rush hour traffic. It's the absolute worst place. We beat Los Angeles in everything. Super Bowl, the World Series, and that traffic. So, part of the solution for the problems there uh, is that there are places like Union Square that aren't right on the team. That's about to change uh, when the Line Extension comes. It's scheduled for 2021, there will be a station here in Union Square. So, from an urban planning standpoint, how important is the Green Line extension? To Union Square in particular, to Somerville. I mean, the Green Line changes everything in Somerville. It, on average, you know, on a land, on land area metric, uh, about 15% of the city's residents have access to transit today, uh, the orange line and red line. Um, but in, I'm sorry, and you're defining that to be within a half mile. From, yeah, yeah, within a half mile. And then uh, it, once the Green Line comes, it will bring us to 85%. So that, that's a drastic change. Uh, everybody, you know, in some amount of those people will have jobs along the Green Line or along the MBTA system, and they'll be able to instantly transfer from out of their automobile uh, on, on the transit. But uh, you know, one of the goals that we have for for the future is to make sure that new development that's built within in those areas around uh, the, the new forthcoming train stations are actually transit oriented. Uh, that's going to take some uh, you know some zoning uh, metrics and also some some you know changing parking policy for for new buildings that are built. Um, it, you know, our on-street parking permits are fairly uh, affordable, let's call it, and, uh, but um, if you really want a transit-oriented building, you can't invite somebody to bring your car and park it on the street. Uh, we need them to behave like they're in a living in a transit-oriented building. Julia, how about for a place like Green Tap, what's the impact? How do your company get to work here every day, and how might that change? Yeah, the G Green Life Center expansion will be huge for us. So uh, an enormous amount of our members do bike to work every day, which is great, but one of the biggest pain points that we hear from our community, both the tenants and the corporate partners and the visitors, is parking. <laughs> so as soon as we have better access or that last mile conversation as part of the, the transportation conversation, um, we'll make a huge difference for everyone here in our community. We have about, just today, my colleague Kara was running some, some numbers and figuring out we have just about 230, 250 people come through Greentown every day. So those are employees of companies that are here every single day. That number fluctuates pretty drastically, day in and day out, upwards to 400 or so on some days. And we can't add more parking spots, <laughs> um, nor should we. Adding more parking spots and adding more cars is not part of the solution, but adding more extensions of the transit lines, more safe bike lanes, et cetera, will change the conversation pretty dramatically. The bike work is great. We were catching up about that before the talk. We've got some people who are really hardcore and they bike all year round, but that's not a solution for everybody. And so there's the public transit aspect. Um, Patty, how about you and your colleagues? How are you at getting to work every day? I don't own a car. Good for you. <laughs> um, how do you yeah. that? Um, I have been very, very lucky. I mean, um, when we realized we were growing out of Greentown Labs, um, we never thought in our wildest dreams of the state being made square. And um, a handful of us walk, bike, a few drive, but um, yeah, I mean, right now we feel super fortunate that we can attract the talent in the area, and it's certainly, um, you know, people come to visit our office and see you 
where they just, you have a great quality of life just surrounding the office, which is critical, and um, if you can walk or bike there, that's, it's, it's amazing. In fact, I imagine your business is maybe in a different position. Some of them may be trucking in large quantities of goods to the market, right? I mean, what kind of a difference maker could it be for them to perhaps have some road space freed up to do that more easily if more people were able to take public transit to get where they could get from Union Square? Uh, yeah, I think from the from the standpoint of deliveries, um, anyone that's driven down several lives uh, in the middle of the day understands how much of a, how much of an issue uh, the large delivery trucks are and the number of cars that are going to park and also pass through the square. Um, and so, uh, Bringing in um, uh, the, the green line and, and, and hoping to uh, reduce the number of people that are parking or needing to drive, uh, I think will have a huge effect both on uh, you know deliveries and, and, and that very specific aspect of you know, stocking retailers and restaurants, um, but also as, as Julia said, sort of changing the conversation, and increasing the idea that um, there are different ways to get around this area and driving. Um, so increasing the number of bike trips. Public transportation trips and walking trips will, will definitely positively affect the number of people that are coming out to vote. As we see already, the most people that are coming to visit us are not driving. And so any anything that increases the, the ability or it's just that people have people have in, in those other three methods, uh, something to look forward to. Dan, what else if anything to the city think about as far as traffic and congestion goes? And some are building in Union Square. I mean, sort of all the eggs in the Green Line expansion basket, or are there other things in the works? Uh, it's, I, some types of congestion pricing, or something to discourage people from driving the area we to? We haven't talked about congestion pricing for Somerville yet. Uh, but, but yet, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say we're primarily focused on, on bike and, and pedestrian improvements across the city. Um, we need we need to step it up more and, and do the you know do more. Um, uh, I'd say we also have conversations about improving the bus system. Um, you know the MTA makes all of those uh, decisions, but uh, the coming of the Green Line actually makes some some bus lines redundant. Uh, the MTA just announced some some improvements that were going on. We're always working in the background to try and make sure that we can improve bus access as much as possible. It's not just about getting to, to downtown. Through, uh, via the MBTA or the, the subway system, it's about also getting to other employment centers via the bus. And so we also invest a lot of time in, in trying to, to advocate for improvements on that system also. Nadia, I want to come back to you for a more tangible version of the uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses question, because you hit on something about the rest a moment ago when you were talking about when Right Hand Robotics was getting ready to grow out of the entire lives and you're thinking about where do you go, you were in a very uh, real life situation where you were thinking, can't we stay here? Do we want to stay here? How did you wrestle with that? Like, what were the strengths of being this that perhaps made you want to stay, or what were the obstacles that made you think about leaving, or perhaps thinking that you had to leave? Um, well, we we realized we had to leave when um, each of our people, we had to squeeze our own down to three foot wide desks here. Um, and um, it was tight, and, and we have a particular space challenge. Not only do we have the people, but we build robots and we have automation systems. Um, so we need a bit of square footage. Um, so naturally, you know, looking out Medford, Waltham, like these areas that um, robotics companies most eventually migrate to. Um, but you know, having been um, in this area for a couple years. Um, it, it was really hard to imagine leaving just the atmosphere and, and like, well, the quality of life is huge around here. You know, you step out and you have all these great restaurants. Um, and so, and of course, cost is a ginormous factor as a tech startup. Um, and um, so, yeah, we need a lot of space, but we didn't have a ton of money. Um, so we're kind of looking everywhere and we just got really lucky. You told me before we came up here, you by the way, you only moved in October of 2017, so it hasn't even been a year and a half, and you're already beginning to feel the squeeze in your new space. So how can Union Square keep a company like yours? I mean, I think it's fair to say that your company is one of the stars of this neighborhood. Um, don't want you to leave, but space constraints and cost are real considerations. What, what can Union Square do to keep you? Um, well, it's certainly bittersweet because there are some spaces opening up, like automotive spaces, but it means that these Businesses are either going out of business or, you know, they choose to or they they realize that they can't stay here, so that's bittersweet. 
Um, but I mean, we've had support from Neos too, and we, I mean, we feel supported in that um, people seem at least somewhat excited about us being here. Um, so, yeah, I, it's, I think um, it's a tough thing because um, if it's a great place to be, it's probably expensive. So, well, yeah. Um, Love more space <laughs> price, but, Always. Um, yeah. So that's a really interesting case study. And Julia, I'm curious what you hear because you've got a larger sample size. You're up to 90 plus companies now that you work with every day here at Green Town Labs. And when things go well, presumably they will outgrow their spaces here and they'll graduate to their own spaces. So when you have those conversations with your entrepreneurs, what are the pros and cons that they weigh as they think about where they might go next, whether they want to stay in Union Square or can stay in Union Square? Sure, good question. Um, we do work really closely with a couple of members on our team, on our operations team, that um, does kind of almost um, serve sort of as an extension of their team to help them connect with local real estate options. And actually, the city is really supportive. Just last night, I got an email from Sue Thomas saying, hey, there's this space opening up. Is it a good fit for one of your tenants who may be graduating? It's 3,500 square feet. Etc. So we, um, being near Union Square, I think is a big factor because their employees are happy here. They often live in the region or in the neighborhood. They want to be able to continue walking or biking, etc. So continuing to um, provide that experience for their own employees is important. Also, um, semi selfishly, we also like to retain them as members of our community, just as offsite members, because we want to continue growing our own community here at Greektown, so they could be offsite and still participate in events, connect with our community, be mentors to our more junior, younger, newer members that are joining. So perhaps like a, a company like Right Hand that has seen pretty big success, they could be a mentor a newer company. Um, so it's pretty important. Like we, and we still have, for anyone who isn't familiar, we have another facility just behind us at 28 Dane Street. So that's 33,000 square feet. This is just about 60. And so we really have more of a campus approach and another smaller spot down um, on Perfersey near Park Street, right here. That direction. Uh, and so we do work with the different landlords over in that neighborhood as well to make sure if anything's opening up, we can help our larger companies find space there. Zach, I know that um, one of your early challenges in starting up home markets or recruiting businesses to come there. So I'm curious, what kind of points do you highlight as you're telling companies, this would be a great place for you to come. Come to Union Square, you're going to have success here. What are the strengths as far as you see? And if they push back at all, what kind of concerns are they raising? Um, we, in, in terms of when we were recruiting businesses, um, the biggest uh, the biggest selling point that we had uh, was around the existing businesses, the existing uh, things that Union Square is already known for. So extremely creative restaurants, some uh, some of the, the best retailers in the city, uh, the Union Square Farmers Market run by Union Square Main Streets. Um, which uh, brings it the most uh, foot traffic to any place in Somerville throughout the week when it, when it is running. Um, so those are the big things that we were able to highlight. So this is already a center uh, for music, for, for the restaurant scene, for sort of um, uh, family-based activities on the weekends. Um, concerns people had were uh, around, um, and things that we were very upfront with, were the lack of daytime traffic, so the lack of shoppers during the day. This is something that we would need to be building up um, as, as we got going. Uh, and uh, lack of parking, lack of you know, the T or, or very major bus lines. Um, and so it was things that uh, people would bring up and we started to enter or, or bring to the conversation early on because it was very normal that anyone that did commit to being part of the market didn't have uh, any misconceptions about you know, the, the foot traffic, especially for our building, which is off the street, um, or you know, the amount of uh, you know, business or lunch traffic that they could expect, uh, especially from the start. So Dan, talk about this digest what we just heard. Uh, from a planning perspective. You mentioned earlier that something like 80% of the city's residents leave the city to go to work every day. And that's one of the concerns that Zach says these businesses are raising. They, they want to set up shop here, but they're worried about getting that daytime traffic. If, if it's sort of a bedroom community and folks aren't here during the day to patronize those businesses, that's an issue for his tenants. So how do you think about that? One of the things we talk about in the office is, is establishing an ecosystem of space sizes within the neighborhood. Um, if, if you want to be able to, to have a home for uh, businesses that are graduating out of Green Town Labs, you have to have space where they, they can accommodate them. That means you need old buildings, new buildings, large buildings, small buildings, 
uh, if, without, without that, as a, as a full ecosystem, you're, you're going to lose uh, companies to, to other locations. So that's a, that's a big one for us. And it, that means that we have to have a, a two-fold perspective, preserving some of the existing buildings that we have now, but also allowing the, the redevelopment of other sites. Uh, I think we have the unique opportunity here in Union Square, and so that's, that's really what we want to do is kind of close the loop, be able to retain a lot of businesses. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of leadership from Greentown. We have um, new players, the US2 is trying to create that same type of ecosystem amongst their properties, and we have other people that are now approaching us um, with, with sites perhaps in Boynton Yards that might be able to contribute to that as well. As well. I'll talk a little bit about gentrification. Um, you know, just last month, the city published an updated version of its long-term strategic plans, the summer vision plan that one of you highlighted earlier. Um, and, and these are some figures that really stood out to me. So to afford the average rent in Somerville right now, you need to make $95,000 a year. Uh, now, to afford, the metric there is no more than 30% of your income dedicated to housing. So about a third of the city uh, that lives here doesn't meet that threshold, and they're overworked. And more than thirty percent uh, for their rent. So at ninety-five thousand dollars a year, it's a pretty steep price. But there's no shortage of people in the city who can't afford that. In fact, according to the Census Bureau, uh, forty-three percent of Somerville households are six-figure households. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering, uh, come back to you, Dan, is you know, from the urban planning standpoint, is there anything that you can do as a city to make sure that the city doesn't become just kind of a homogenous? group of affluent people who can afford to be here? How do you maintain that diversity, especially for folks who've lived here for a long time and don't want to get squeezed out? That's an incredibly complicated question. The, uh, the, well, yeah, the, nature, the nature of change makes, makes um, uh, countering those same forces very difficult. Um, you know, one of the things that we that planning has figured out how to do is, is require inclusionary, uh, have inclusionary zoning to make sure that some affordable units are produced. Um, we need more programs that can help encourage the development of, of middle income households. Um, we are, we reformed our, uh, or, or edited our uh, affordable housing chapter to, to actually create a new tier of affordable housing that's more oriented towards middle income. Um, one of the surprising things is that if I was not married, I would qualify for an affordable unit, a uh, home ownership unit, even with a city job. You know, it's, it, it, and and we, you know, we currently pay over 40% of our, our income to housing. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a big issue in, in the core, and um, you know, I think one of the things to, to figure out is how our major cities, uh, Boston, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, places like that, um, can get over the hump of, of investment housing. You know, for, uh, foreign interest banking their money in, in units here actually has a, uh, a big impact on the availability of housing. Um, because it's more stable asset than sometimes other other places that people invest in. Um, I, th I think those are, the, are you know larger challenges than something that like a zoning ordinance can can ever accommodate or, or try to take on by itself. So now, then, how does a business like Right Hand think about that situation? Because what Dan's describing is kind of a sacrifice to say, you know, this is such a desirable location to live in and work in that I'm willing to pay 40 percent of the household income to housing. So if for a company like yours and you're thinking about where your, your co-workers are, are going to live, um, is that just part of the game, that it's such a desirable place to be, that enough people will make that sacrifice and be willing to pay that amount of money to be here, or, or do you feel like more needs to be done to uh, keep housing more affordable as a percentage of income that we see right now? I mean, it's certainly a challenge, especially um, when we want to attract people who don't live here. Um, you know, uh, people coming from out of town or out of state, they'll look at the cost to rent or to buy, and you know, one of the first things they might say is, um, the cost of living is much higher, but you want to pay me you know, a comparable salary to what I'm getting, and it's a huge consideration that people make. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's just the two sides, you know, the, it's, we love it here for many, for many reasons that also want the, the house of living to go up, and um, so, um, of course, it'd be great if, if it were, um, if people found it more affordable, but, yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge. And how about, Julia, for the companies here at Greentown, you know, it, I'm thinking especially a lot of them um, may be seeking venture capital investments or already have received venture capital investments. And then the question becomes, how do you use that money? And this is a debate that I think a lot of startups have, which is, you know, is our uh, 
money that's spent on being in a prime location that may be expensive, but we think can attract premier talent, but then we have to pay those people accordingly so they can afford to live here, so you're you're not getting as much bang for your buck, perhaps if you went out to Wall Bay and things would be a little bit cheaper. How do your companies digest that, that uh, tension? Um. Big question. Uh, they so a lot of them are between the seed round of funding and Series A round of funding, so they're pretty financially strapped in terms of when we talk about startups and funding and fundraising. They're early stage in terms of the amount of money they've raised, and very small companies typically from about two to three people to about ten to twelve, sometimes twenty by the time they graduate from Greentown Lab. So they are hyper concerned about their. Um, uh, we call, call it runway in the startup world of how much money do they have until they run out um, and before they start selling product and bringing in revenue to close that gap between when they fundraise to when they're starting to turn, generate profitable revenue. Um, so they're hyper concerned about it. I think it's a complex conversation around if they were to move out to Watertown or Waltham or Burlington, how are their employees that are coming from these generally um, local universities right in this hyperfence area over here, how are they going to get out there? So that's a big conversation, um, point of conversation. So I think they're very concerned about it. Fundraising is always a key topic area for our community. Um, and on the Greentown Lab side, we do try to keep the rent fairly at market or below market as best we can, which is why we do have a pretty extensive network of partners and other, um, some grants that we apply for as an organization so that we can try and keep rent fairly reasonable, as reasonable as we can, per square foot in the lab space that you see to your left and the number of, and by desk up in the office space. So it's a pretty, hopefully, manageable and reasonable price point for them. Zach, I wonder if some of these cost concerns might actually be kind of music to your ears in a way. I mean, isn't it good for your businesses to have a lot of really well-heeled potential customers running around Somerville? <laughs> um, it's great for the people that are coming to uh, to Bull Market to have money. That, that is for sure. Um, I think uh, the, the, the two flip sides of that are a lot of our business owners are some of our residents themselves. Um, and so there, there needs to be a balance between how much money they are able to make as small business owners, as members of the community, and, and how much money they're being charged to live in their houses to either buy or rent. Um, and I think the, the other side of that is we, we're really interested in, in having a diverse offering of products and services and um, offerings uh, at our market that, that come from um, you know, people with diverse backgrounds that you know, maybe haven't quite figured out exactly how to, uh, how to uh, get all the money from the people in some of them. So having the ability to, to test out newer and, and different and, um, uh, things that, that aren't quite proven yet uh, is something that, that you know, needs to happen before people are necessarily going to spend their money with us. You know, before we got up here, I was reminiscing with uh, Greg here at, at Greentown, your director of lab and member resources. We met, where is Greg? There he is. Fact. So we met probably five years ago when he was working for Kapow. There you go, free, you know, still using the Kapow lid. Uh, over at Fringe, which was a, a now defunct co working space here in Union Square that closed a couple of years ago. When I wrote about Fringe in Boston Globe at the time, I described it as a uh, which is probably. Yeah. That was a little bit run down, I think it's fair to say. But it was beautiful in its own way. And it was actually a really great space, and it was very accessible for early stage companies that didn't have a lot of capital. And so uh, my question, maybe I'll start with, uh, I'll start with you, Julia, since you run another incubator of sorts with a much larger scale. Do we have enough gritty spaces left in Union Square? Or are we getting too polished? I mean, this place is beautiful. Um, but do we lose something when we lose places like Fringe? And are we replacing them? Right. Thank you. Uh, we like to think we're still gritty in our own way. It is a new building, but we have a grittiness in terms of the way our entrepreneurs approach their building their companies, and they're in the lab until 2 in the morning, and so I think maybe that's how we're thinking about gritty. But in terms of physical spaces, um, I think, you know, retrofitting and renovating a lot of our beautiful existing uh, facilities that are in Union Square specifically and then Somerville more broadly, I think, is really part of what makes Somerville really special. Um, we have really deep roots to manufacturing and fabrication space, especially here in Union Square area, and I think that that's a lot of what, part of the reason why Greentown's so 
proud to be here too because that's a lot of what our companies here are doing. They're building physical products and hopefully they can then stay in the neighborhood and build their companies and be selling their new physical products that can help stay, you know, ideally help with the environment and mitigate climate change. Talk about that topic. But um, I think we still have grittiness if we embody it in the new, the new grittiness 2.0, I guess. How about the city's view? Yeah, you know, you know, sort of grit versus polish things you think about. I mean, it's, it's always nice when you see things turn over in a way you get neighborhoods revitalized, that kind of thing. But, you know, is there a downside to that as well? Do you worry at all about uh, losing something? But we actually talk about it a lot. We, we want to see development in, in Union Square across the city that actually it enhances the existing character, not replaces it with something. So we want to be a better version of ourselves and not lose ourselves in, in, as development happens. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, we see some places in the, in the new zoning ordinance is that it upzones certain areas, but then it pretty much puts a, a regulation in place that exact, uh, close or exactly matches what's already there. And that's, that's designed to try and preserve those existing assets and not actually cause them to be replaced wholesale. Uh, you might always have some, some amount of upgrading of an interior space, um, but a lot of sites like this are, are, are kept at an at a entitlement that is pretty much what, what's there today. And that, that's specifically designed to try and hold some of those assets and make sure that we don't lose all the grittiness as the city continues to develop. Nadia, what do you hear from your colleagues on this subject? I mean, you, you have team members who've, who've been working here at Union Square for a long time now, between uh, your time here at Green Time Labs and your own uh, building now. So uh, I assume the, the character of the neighborhood or changes you've seen in, in recent years come up. What are those conversations like? What have you observed? What, what do you like and not like? Um, well, so we're in an old post office building built in 1935, so we embrace, we, we call it the charm, you know, it's, um, and um, I think, you know, we look to other hardware startups in the area, a lot of them like will kind of manufacturing facilities, and, and we love that feeling, I mean, um, we, so, um, in talking about kind of the changes here, um, you know, it is, it's beautiful, but it is bittersweet when, um, you know, we think the, the change is good for us, but it means like maybe some folks are, can't afford to stay here for their businesses and that sort of thing. Um, but in terms of just, um, talking about the, the, the infrastructure, I mean, we, we embrace that and try to take full advantage of it. Exactly. What have you felt as you've gotten the whole market up and running with it? Have you been, felt that you feel that you've been fully embraced by the neighborhood? Have you heard some rumbling about you know, just another, you know, cool hipster place with people with some money to go spend? You know what I mean? What, what have you been doing? Um, it, I would say overwhelmingly we've been embraced by the neighborhood. Uh, we've definitely heard uh, uh, critiques around, uh, you know, it being a place that uh, is for a specific subset of the city or uh, sort of new people moving into the city. Um, and we take those very seriously um, because it is, it's, it's incredibly important to us that uh, everyone knows that they're welcome to the market um, and that, uh, you know, there is something there for them. One of the things that we um, that, that we highlight as a goal for the space is that you don't need to spend money to have a good time. You can come and enjoy uh, you know, free performances or enjoy the courtyard or, or uh, uh, the lobby spaces without spending any money. Um, and we, we find it incumbent on us to really um, make that story a part of our story and ensure that everyone in the community knows that uh, you know, this space is, is for them throughout the day. And then we also make sure to reach out to groups uh, for, you know, we're, we're always willing and able to offer discounted rates for, you know, events or you know, hold their own, um, uh, their own events in our space, uh, which, which again is a way for us to make sure that everyone knows that they are welcome there. And one of the other things I liked about the fridge co-working space was that it was sort of a micro-economy within itself, and a lot of the businesses there were also each other's clients. And I wonder if you have any of the same phenomenon going on with Bo. Um, and if so, how do you foster that? I mean, you obviously want to branch out to some degree, but it is nice to just continually reinvest in one another. What do you observe right now? Yeah, that's a big thing uh, about how we uh, how we plan to, uh, what I want to say, honestly save money amongst the businesses. So uh, in terms of uh, 
in terms of restaurant sharing resources, um, if they're able to pool an order and get you know, a larger amount of vegetables for a um, lesser amount of money. Um, we have a, a, an on-site small grocery store, um, and if they have goods that are going off, we found that in the you know, two months that they've been open, they've been able to sell those goods to um, some of the other restaurants that they can use them in a daily special. Similarly, on the, on the retail side, we have incredible artists, we have folks that are able to tailor clothes, so we have a woman who sells uh, vintage clothing, and then there's a few rows down, uh, someone that could tailor those jeans or jacket to fit uh, their new owner. Um, so it is really important to us to, uh, to see and to facilitate the idea that folks from within the market are supporting one another and then supporting the, the rest of the, the businesses around Union Square. And Julia, out of here at Greentown, you've got 90 plus businesses right now. How much overlap is there? Are they able to uh, sort of work alongside each other? It's, I mean, one of the reasons you come to a place like this is to gain some intangibles from each other. Um, ideas, camaraderie, and stuff. But is there a tangible quality to it as well? It's some commerce. Absolutely, definitely a lot of intangibles in terms of guidance and support and resources. We have a couple different internal communications platforms where just this week one member said, Hey, I'm negotiating a term sheet. Can anybody help me walk through this? And immediately he got like seven or eight responses of like, Yeah, let me help you know, re review that with you. More similarly, or differently on the tangible side, we do have a company here that makes off grid solar controller, um, controllers that we have other companies that make like a um, self-writing sailing drone that is solar, that is wind and solar powered. Um, that's, so it's a boat. It's a boat that's a drone that's powered by wind and solar. <laughs> um, and so we have different components that are made here by other companies that um, can provide you know technology for the other technologies that are in development right next door. Is that a goal, Dan, for the city, or are you sort of hands off on that? Is, is sort of promoting local spending in that way, making sure that uh, you know money that's generated in a place like Union Square stays within Union Square, or, or like I say, is that sort of beyond the city's control or, or interest? I'd say that's probably something that's outside of our control, but definitely something that we are we promote on a, on a daily basis. That um, I mean, a shout out to all the Main Streets organizations that exist out there. Re recycling local dollars is one of the best things you can do for a community. Um, so I think you know we're all we're all on that same page. But it's it's out, outside of support mechanisms and programs. There's not really a lot of law that you can put in place and like support or something like that. I suppose it can happen more naturally too if there are more jobs within Somerville, right? Because those people are on, they're taking their lunch breaks, they're doing their uh, their quick errands and whatnot during the work day, right in here, as opposed to leaving the city to do that. Right. The, I mean, the demand itself has, a, you know, the market tends to react to demand. So more more people and the more jobs that we have here with their their varied interests will, you know, will have somewhat feed that system itself. So I want to pull in a few of the questions that uh, you all submitted when you were registering for here, and I think we're going to open it up in just a few minutes to an audience question and answer. But there were some quick ones that came together that I think the panelists got to see as well, um, and I want to we'll just go down down the line and we'll do some of these quickly. Um, Dan, I'll start with you again. I'm curious about the, the city's comprehensive plan that we're talking about, the summer vision. Um, in, in just a minute, I mean, how important is that for you? I mean, is that sort of a guide that you use on a daily basis? Is it, is it broader than that? Um, how significant is the summer vision plan? So I have a funny story about that because I first encountered the, the process of summer vision being written from Arizona while I was still in grad school. Um, and so I've been paying attention. The, the summer is in the media around the, around the nation, especially in planning and, and development spheres. And uh, so I, already, I was already aware of what was going on here before we even moved to Boston. Um, but that is something that we use on a daily basis. So, you know, the 586 goals, policies, and actions kind of drive all of the work that we do. Um, we try to stick to it. It's it's time for an update, which is why we've launched Supervision 2040. Um, but as the world changes, our comprehensive plans going to have to grow with it. Um, but that, that's the primary driver for how we make all of our decisions from our department. Julia, these policy documents can be pretty dull. Is that something that is of any use to a place like like Green Town Labs? Is it is it something that uh, it helps you plan? for Greentown Labs' future and how it lines up with the cities, or, or is it just uh, sort of off your radar? No, it's on the radar for sure. I don't think I've read all 586 items in the plan, but we've definitely read the plan. We posted um, a piece of the plan as the Climate Forward Action Committee, which is a part of the Supervision Plan, I believe, or maybe a tangential one. Very involved in that. Um, I think specifically transit, as we've talked kind of quite a bit about tonight, that's a, 
hot topic for our community, so especially in that area of the summer vision plan. Um, and I think because so many of our community members are also residents, we try to be hyper involved with the city so that we can represent them both on the commercial tenant side, but also as active residents contributing to the community. Now, you talked a little bit about your company's growth and thinking about where you might go next. Does the city having a, a coherent strategic plan make any difference in that calculus for you? Um, we'll have to see. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, currently we're, we're looking into spaces uh, to expand into. We'd love to stay here as long as we can, so. And Zach, as a more recent arrival with the market, I mean, did you take a look at uh, the long-term plan of the city, and did that help you feel good about making an investment here in Somerville, or is that not a factor? Uh, it definitely was a factor. We definitely paid uh, a lot of attention to the, the Summer Vision Plan, to the Union Square Neighborhood Plan that came out right around the time we were getting going. Um, and so it was it was really good to see that the, the city was planning for the changes that were coming and, and helped us anticipate um, you know, what things that we'd be confronted with and what opportunities existed for us as we were going to you know, be two and three years and five years into our uh, existence. Right, we'll come back the other way. Another question that you all submitted, I'll start with Zach. What do you see as the most pressing need for Union Square in the next two or three years? Uh, the, the, the thing that I, I keep coming back to around this is walkability. Um, so the ability for people to feel safe, feel comfortable, and, and have sort of ease of travel, uh, no matter where they are going in the square. Uh, when, when we're um, talking about Union Square Main Streets and sort of the Union Square area as a whole, it's actually a really, really large space. Um, and so for folks to feel comfortable going from uh, some of the bread company all the way down to, uh, to Air Mount Brewery, um, and, and know that there's a quick, easy, and safe path to get there, I think that will have a huge impact on uh, the small businesses in the market and, and around the square. How about for you, Danny? The most pressing need for Union Square in the next couple of years? Um, I saw that question. I don't know if I have a good satisfying answer, but similarly, just getting around biking, especially. Like, I I personally prefer to walk just because um, I, you know, I, I, I am afraid to bike sometimes in the area with all the, um, the crazy intersections. Um, but, um, yeah. You can have the same one, that's enough. <laughs> Julie, what do you see as the most pressing? Transportation, walking, biking, transit via not everyone having their own car. There's a theme here, Dan. Anything different from you? Yeah. Or is transportation kind of one in your book as well? Transportation. <laughs>
really are working on a lot of important topics all at once. So. Otherwise. Okay, well, maybe it's the Amazon deal. And I'll be guilty as anybody because I let off with that question. But Nadia, maybe that's a place to come to you. I mean, I don't know how many man hours of taxpayer dollars went into preparing a bid from some of But was that a waste of time? I mean, should we just say, forget them and let's just focus on who we already have and, and grow with that? Um, I don't have enough information to say anything to, yeah, truthfully. <laughs> Also, like Zach, is there anything that you've seen in your time that you think you're just spending too much time, wasting too much energy on this, you should not be focusing on? Um, I don't I think it, 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 it's uh, to be a little less dramatic than I usually like to be. Um, one thing I, I think is a big part of the conversation and is written into the subdivision plan that uh, I think is talked about in a, in a strange way. Um, or I should, I should say, I, I think there's many different ways of, of uh, achieving this goal, and I think it only gets talked about in one way, which is maintaining the character of our neighborhoods. Um, that's something that uh, a lot of people talk about and a lot of uh, time is spent, and I think that there are many different ways of achieving that goal. I think it's a very work, worthwhile goal, especially as it relates to the people that live here and the sorts of people that are able to live here. Um, but I don't necessarily think it means uh, uh, maintaining the structure as it is today, so sort of putting a bubble around some of the 2017, 2018, and saying that that's what it needs to be for the next 50 years. Dear audience member who came up with that very good question, my apologies for not drawing <laughs> juicier answers out of our panel. I tried. All right, last thing before I turn it over for the audience to ask some more questions. I like this one, and it's a good sort of lightning round, it's an easy way to. What's your go to bar for a restaurant? <laughs> right around. Exactly, let me start with you. The entirety of Walmart. The whole bar. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.